Okay, folks, hang in there. This is our last section, and we're going to breeze through a lot of modern art movements. Movements are um, typically these things that end with ism, and they are groups of artists that sort of work in a similar fashion. And we're going to be looking at these movements to talk about how they responded to that modern art challenge, that modern art challenge of doing something new that hasn't been done before. So we're going to start with the Expressionists. And the Expressionists are largely painters, um, even though Marcel Duchamp sort of broke the mold and said, hey, guys, you don't have to paint if you want to be an artist. There are still people who like to paint and they want to paint. And there's still definitely an audience um, who appreciates painting. So the Expressionists wanted to paint. And Vasily Kandinsky actually wrote a book called The Spirituality of Art. And... Um, he advocated for painting with your feelings. So for number 22, and it says, what new ideas did expressionists present? They allowed artists to paint what they felt. They wanted you to express yourself through your art. And that's not really something we've seen very much in art up until this point. Um, classical art was all about being objective and sort of showing something happening as if we were watching a movie. And Impressionism still was about showing something. But Expressionism is all about self-reflection. It's sort of understanding what the artist is feeling. And we haven't really gotten to that touchy-feely side of, of art making until this point in art history. Um, fast forward then to the Surrealist. Number 23 says, what made Surrealists unique in art history? The Surrealists were unique because, again, like the Expressionists, they wanted to paint, but they painted things that could only be real in dreams. So that's what's unique to them. They painted things that could only be real in dreams. So in this Salvador Dali painting, which I really wish I could take you to see the actual one in real life. It's 16 feet tall. It is a ginormous painting and there's so many little teeny tiny details in this. Um, but Salvador Dali got all of his inspiration from his dreams. Um, he and other surrealists would keep dream journals and then those images would appear in their artwork. Um, not only dreams, but also these little subconscious moments where even when you're really awake, you see or you hear or you do things you don't really mean to do. So this, <laughs> this ginormous painting was actually inspired by a situation that many of you can probably relate to. Salvador Dali was at a conference in New York City. Uh, with a whole bunch of other artists. And he went to go watch a lecture and he wanted to take some notes. And he realized, oh man, he forgot a pencil, just like a lot of you guys do. And so we went to go bum one from his friend and he said, hey, can I borrow a pencil? And his friend handed him an entire box of Venus pencils. And if you remember the Venus de Milo, um, you can kind of see her right here. The Venus de Milo was printed on the pencil box. And at first, Salvador Dali did not see the Venus de Milo. He saw a matador. Do you know what a matador is? A matador is a bullfighter. And so he sort of shook his head and he was like, oh, there's me next painting. I'm not kidding. Those are the exact words he used. Um, and he went home and started sketching up these really elaborate um combinations of the Venus de Milo and a matador. And you can see this painting um, in St. Petersburg, Florida at the Salvador Dali Museum in all of its glory and detail. But what's really cool about it is the double imagery. There's two pictures, just like what he saw. There's the pictures of the Venus de Milo's repeated over and over and over again as she kind of like fades into the background. She turns around. But then if you squint your eyes, there's also a picture of a matador. It's kind of hard to see, um, but his eyes are right here. His nose is here. His mouth is here. This whole area right here is his face. And, and sort of blurred out, but this is like his little red cap that he's wearing. 
Um, the white drapery right here is actually the collar of his shirt. The green part here is his necktie. And the red drape that's around this Venus would be like the red drape that is over his shoulder. Um, so you can pause and look at this a little bit harder if you want to. Um, in real life, it's extra hard to see because it's so big, like it sort of engulfs you and you have to step back to really see it. Um, another thing that's easier to see because it's so small here is the picture of the bull. There's a bull and he's drinking from a pond. Um, but in real life, that was one of the things that was hardest for me to see. So like I said, it's loaded with imagery and symbolism. It looks like a weird wackadoo dream that he probably had. Um, this picture in the bottom right corner is actually a, an image of him as a little boy. And this picture in the top left, you might think, ooh, that's Jesus. It's not. It's a picture of his wife. Um, so there's all sorts of weird little little pictures as we go along here. Okay, so let's um, fast forward to the formalist and minimalist. Um, this is a popular style that even Katy Perry made it popular, pop, popular, popular in one of her videos. Um, and she used the this minimalist pattern that was created by Pierre Mondrian. Um, but there's three different movements here that are all kind of doing the same thing. The Der Stylist, which is actually what Mondrian was part of um, in, in Sweden, and the Formalist and the Minimalist. All of them sort of do the same thing. And what they are aiming to do for number 24 is to strip everything away from art except for the most basic elements of design. Um, so if you think about the elements of design, you may have studied them in elementary school or sixth or seventh grade. The elements of design are shape. So P.A. Mondrian has given us the most basic shapes of rectangles and squares. Um, color. So he has the most basic primary colors, red, yellow, and blue value, which is like how light and dark things are. And so he has the most extreme values, black and white. In line, he has very basic straight lines. Um, and then we have form also. Form sort of is talks about something's three-dimensionality. Well, this has like no form. It's very flat and superficial. So all of these movements are reducing art down to its most basic elements. So when you look at a piece of artwork like this, it's not supposed to have a lot of frills. It is supposed to sort of show you what the skeleton of art looks like. You can't have really complex pictures like, um, like the Salvador Dali painting on the last slide. You can't have those pictures. Oh, went too far can't have these things without these things. So it is these basic elements that help to give us the more complex pictures that we enjoy. Um, the color fieldists for number 25 are very similar to the formalist and minimalist because they take everything away from art except for one element of design. You know what that element is? Color. So they take everything away from art etc. They literally try to make fields of color. If you recall that really expensive smudgy square painting by Mark Rothko, he sort of fits into the color fieldist movement. He created these vast, huge canvases um, that feel like they're going to swallow you up with color. Helen Frankenthaler is a female artist um, who created these huge, vast color fields too. But they're really interested in how putting certain colors together can affect you. And there's some science behind it too. Like, did you know that if you were to lift weights in a blue room, you could actually lift more weight than you can in any other colored room? That's interesting. Um, if you're in a red room, it makes you hungry. So colors have this strange effect on us, not just emotionally, um, but in the way that our bodies physio physiologically respond to them. And so that's what the color fieldists were all about, reducing art to just color. Then we have one of my favorite art movements. It's not for everybody, <laughs> but we have conceptual art. 
Now you could definitely argue that Marcel Duchamp with Fountain was probably the first example of conceptual art. Conceptual art for number 26, the key goal is simply to make the viewer think. The key goal of conceptual art is just to make the viewer think. Um, and so we have this example here. And if you were to see this in real life, you would see a picture on the wall, a photograph of a chair. There would be an actual chair on the floor that you could like sit your bum bum in. And then on the wall, there's a dictionary definition of, guess it? the word chair. So there's three different versions of chairs. In fact, the title of this piece is called One and Three Chairs. So I'm going to ask you, and just kind of internalize your answer here, how many chairs are there? You might think that there's one chair. You might think there's two chairs. You might think there's three chairs. Some of you might think that there's more than three chairs. And some of you might think that none of them count as chairs. And actually, this sort of reflects a really interesting philosophical idea that Socrates um, introduced back in um, ancient Greek times. And he suggested that um, there are certain qualities that actually make things things. So we could sit here and have an entire discussion about which of these three chairs really are allowed to qualify as chairs? Um, is it a matter of functionality? Does it have to be that we can actually use the thing? Is it a matter of representation? Can you represent a chair with a picture or words and still have it can be considered a chair? So until you've seen this arrangement of three chairs, you've probably never really thought much about it. But conceptual art has a way of making us think about things in a brand new way. When you have situations like this in an art museum, it just sort of makes you scratch your head and think, hmm, what is this about? And those who are willing to take the time to really think about it can have sort of like a little philosophical journey. Okay, so the last type of art I want to talk about is conceptual art. I'm sorry, no, 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 not conceptual art, installation art. So what makes installation art different than a painting or a sculpture? This right here is one of my favorite examples of installation art. Um, installation art is different than painting or sculpture because it transforms entire spaces. It transforms entire spaces. So this artist, Sandy Skoglund, has taken up an entire room and installed cheese puffs everywhere. In fact, you can see a similar installation by Sandy Skoglund um, pretty close to home at the Dayton Art Institute. Some of you may have seen it before. Um, it's in the uh, on the ground level in sort of like the like the children's experience area and the floor and the wall or the floor is completely covered with jelly beans and then there's a couple of uh, mannequins sort of like these that are also covered in jelly beans and then the background walls that are kind of similar to this rather than being covered in jelly beans they're covered in fake butterflies um, it's a really interesting thing if you ever get a chance to go see it but that's what installation art does. It transforms entire spaces. And those spaces are pretty ephemeral. They don't usually last forever. Um, it's hard to, to kind of box up an installation and sell it. I had mentioned before, though, that Marcel Duchamp did that. He worked on an installation in his own house. Again, he's one of the, the first people to probably do an installation. Um, and that was before we even had the term installation for art. But he made one in his apartment and then boxed it up with all the blueprints and left it for the Philadelphia Art Museum to reassemble behind that giant thick wooden door. It's a really interesting thing. But installation art is really important today. If you were to go see any sort of modern art, contemporary art museum, you are sure to find an installation. Okay, folks. So that concludes um, our, our notes. And over the next couple days, we're going to be learning about some living artists. And as we go through that, you're going to notice some of these themes that are really big in art today. 
you're going to see shock and drama. I can't show you because at school some of the most shocking things that are done in art. But if you pay attention to the news from time to time, artists still create some pretty big controversies. Um, they, they definitely like to get a rise out of their audience. Another thing you see is interactive stuff, like installations that you can walk through or things you can actually participate in. I remember one time I went to the Wexner Center in, um, it's on OSU's campus, and I walked into this huge installation that had 500 500 pound blocks of modeling clay. And the viewers were invited to take hunks of the clay and make their own sculptures and then put them up on the wall. So it was like an interactive experience. And there's a whole lot of other examples like that today too. Um, think about like Marina Abramovich sitting in the chair and how you can sit across from her in the other chair. Um, movement. A lot of art today is not just um, static pictures and sculptures sitting in one place, but they might actually physically move. Another thing is that's really important is viewer interpretation. Just like how Marcel Duchamp's urinal started a conversation, um, a lot of the artwork that you see in a museum that's been produced in the past 50 years um, is intended for your mental consumption. It is something that you are supposed to consider and think about. Not that you have to like it, but just that you can interpret it. Um, originality is also really, really important in today. In order for an artist to really become well-known and famous, they have to do something that hasn't been done before. And unusual materials are also really interesting in today's art. Artists are not just limited to bronze and marble and oil paints. They have a whole world of interesting materials at their fingertips to create new things out of, like cheese puffs. And um, another thing that you always see in contemporary art, and I have an example actually sitting right here in front of you, are art historical references. Artists today realize that they don't live in a vacuum. They are living in um, contemporary art history, and it has been... Um, it is something that has been paid for them by artists like Marcel Duchamp and Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock and Pablo Picasso and Van Gogh. All of these artists created this world where they are so free to do what they want and how they want. And so quite often you see a nod to classical artists. Um, so this is actually an installation that refers to this classical painting by Jacques-Louis David. Um, and the artist has just modernized it. Instead of having this paper in his hand, this guy has a laptop. Um, the position of the body that's in the bathtub is still the same, but it's been modernized, the colors have been changed, and it's just something new. So that's some of the stuff you have to look forward to, and I'm excited to share some of my favorite living artists with you. Thanks for listening, everybody.